Hello, I'm Michael Kurland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Be Better podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kurland. Very excited today. We have Holly Shannon joining us, host and producer of the podcast Culture Factor 2.0. Holly, why don't you introduce yourself a little more? Uh, introduce yourself a little more to the to the audience. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me, Michael. This is really great. I'm excited to be part of the Be Better audience. <laughs> um, I am a podcaster as well, so it's kind of strange being on the other side of the seat here, but um, I'm very happy to be here because I love podcasting and I love um, conversation around company culture because I think it's a, a critical component these days. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you are actually my first also culture podcast uh, guest ever. So that is awesome. Hey. <laughs> we're, and we're, we're excited to have you on here to kind of, it's like a mirror, right? So we're just going to be kind of talking yeah, about- Yeah, it's like podcasting for the win and company culture for the win. <laughs> exactly. I, I love it. So we talked a little bit about what you do, but why do you do it? Why do you, you podcast about culture? Let's talk about it. Um, well, probably I should just walk you back a little bit. Um, I got into podcasting kind of by accident. Um, I've always been in Don't the marketing we all? space. Don't we all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was uh, helping t uh, a startup that had um, a SaaS software they were selling, and we wanted to create a podcasting tool to use for pull marketing um, to, for lead generation. So it kind of started in a very different manner. And um, I ended up really loving it. And um, our conversation was focused on company culture. And uh, I really loved that conversation as well. Um, I've since um, taken over the podcast and rebranded it as Culture Factor 2.0. Um, and in doing so, I've kind of shifted the conversation as well. Um, originally, it was uh, from the C-suite. And, uh, you know, the, the old adage, culture eats strategy for breakfast. But I felt that there was a shift happening and I felt that the pandemic had been a part of that shift. And I felt that that conversation was almost a little stale and not representative of what was happening in the real world right now. So um, why do I do it? I do it because I think there are um, there is emerging leadership happening across all levels of companies from the sales coordinator um, through middle management and on up. And, and while company culture might still somewhat be dictated, of course, from the top or shapes it, I think that we're seeing a lot of um, people um, emerging as leaders that maybe didn't have the opportunity before. And so I'm trying to represent their voices on the show um, and also people who have written about it that maybe have been on both sides of the fence. And um, so I think the conversation's changing and I'm really excited to be able to share that with listeners. Yeah, it's fun. Funny. I was uh, doing another interview yesterday and we were talking about a very similar thing about emerging leadership and culture and how does that get trained and ingrained into them. And that's something that I personally have uh, taken on at Branded Group is trying to impart our culture into our leaders. So our leaders, you know, impart it into our, our um, employees and, and it just is like organically grown. So, you know, you have to, you can't just expect someone to walk in day one as your sales manager and then all of a sudden take the culture on and a hundred percent and know what they're doing. You gotta, you gotta, you know, bring that leadership up. So I, I really like what you're talking about there. But I, I got to ask you, I, I know our next question is what you're curious about, but I am curious about this. I've never heard the old adage, 
uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast. So can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Cause that, that one just really got me. That was great. Oh, okay. So, so it's pretty famous line. Um, and you know, it was the theory that, um, companies, have all types of strategy initiatives that they put in place, right? How they're going to scale, uh, funding they're going to take on. Um, there's always initiatives. There's sales initiatives and, and marketing and production goals. Um, but at the end of the day, where culture eats strategy for breakfast, culture is such um, it's the reason why we show up to work more often than not. And while you might be great in sales and you meet those goals and you're part of those initiatives, if you really hate your boss, um, you probably aren't going to stay there very long. And by leaving the, the company, <clears throat> it, um, it makes it harder for the C-suite to meet those initiatives, right? Because it kind of keeps getting stalled. Like if you have, you know, everybody's got goals they have to do and people are, your churn is really, you know, <laughs> bad, you know, like people just keep coming in and out. You never really progress, right? You're just going to kind of stay at a plateau. Um, Seth Godin wrote a book, <clears throat> um, This is Marketing. And in it, he said, which I think is the right way to say it, is that culture is strategy. And if you make that first and foremost on your plate um, in a company in terms of your missions and your values, um, I think you probably will be doing better in the long haul. So, yeah, I, I love I it. I, I, I didn't quite connect the dots, but now that you, you know, drew the, the straight line for me, uh, totally makes sense. And yeah, uh, if you hate your boss, it doesn't matter if you're hitting all your, all your goals and you're making all your money, you're just not going to be happy. And I think you're, you know, from our point of view at Brandon Group, we definitely made culture part of our strategy. And to your point, our retention rate is 96%. You know, we were- oh, That's we were, amazing. Yeah. It, it, if, you knew, if you knew our industry, it's even more amazing, right? Because it's just, it's not a fun industry to be in for some of our employees. Uh, it's not- it's just, a, it's a hard job. I'll, I'll, I'll say that, but uh, I digress. So what are you curious about right now? Uh, you know, I think I would probably dial back a little bit to the beginning of our conversation of leading where, wherever you are. I'm, in, I'm really excited and curious to see um, how companies reshape themselves um, and allow that emerging leadership to come in. Um, I think that by doing that, they're going to see um, a lot of innovation um, and a lot of good changes in the company, being open to that intrapreneurship, if you want to call it that. And, and I, think, um, I think people are ready for that. I think they're ready to do business differently. We, we've all been forced to work at home. Um, and I think that by doing that, our situations look similar. So, you know, you're, you're, you might have your boss, your director of your department or somebody in the C-suite and somebody working for you. And we all look the same right now. We're all sitting in that spare bedroom um, or the kitchen and the kids are running through and you're thinking about, I got to transfer the laundry and I got to go get some groceries and I didn't exercise today. And I'm in this interview right now, but they don't realize I have my pajama pants on. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, your boss has the identical thing. Whereas before we were in these behemoth skyscrapers and it was really clear, you could stand outside and look up and say, okay, well, the C-suite's way up there and we're on all the other levels and they never hear or really see us. And our offices are, look very different from theirs. Now we all kind of look the same. And I, I think that's actually an advantage. I, at least I'm feeling that from people I've talked to, that it's, um, it's actually allowed for um, stronger connections between levels. Uh, I, I think you've touched on some very poignant points. Um, we, I was talking in an interview recently and they were saying that we've, by, by going to work from home, we've exposed a lot of the bad habits. We didn't even know were bad habits in the workplace. Right. And 
to your point, you know, the, le- the levels, maybe that was the hierarchy that we just were accustomed to now. It's, it's everyone's kind of leveled out because I'm not going to lie. I'm wearing my branded group green workout shorts right now. So, hey, and, no judgment here. Yeah. Hey, where's, I, where's my branded group swag? Please. Uh, oh, it's coming. It's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think you, you, you said it best. It's a, it's a new way to do business and I think everyone's ready for it. And mm-hmm. I personally, you know, just speaking of going to the office, I don't ever want to feel like I have to go back to the office. I want to go back to the office because I want to go see my people when it's appropriate to go back to the office. But, and I, I do miss my commute. That's one thing. That's another thing that has been a common, like a recurring theme is people that are missing their commute because it's kind of like their downtime, but. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But, that time where you can just sort of decompress and sort of think about what your day is going to look like, or at the end of the day, listen to a podcast, yeah. just throwing that out there a- uh, for 20 minutes on your way home. Like now that opportunity is a little bit, um, now our commute is from our bedroom to the kitchen, our kitchen to the laundry room or whatever, right? Exactly. Or when you, you got to make time for your commute when you walk the dog for way longer than the dog is wanting to walk, but <laughs> you need to get out of the house. So, Especially if Fido is like 15. Yeah. Uh, mine, mine's three, but he's only 15 pounds. So he is in the best shape. He has not got the pandemic pounds. He's lost the pandemic pounds because I just keep yeah. walking him. But That's good. That's good. Is. I I have a four-year-old golden doodle. So I have a I have a very um, active dog. Very nice. Yeah. So what motivates you to be better? I mean, you're on the Be Better podcast for a reason. So what, what are, is motivating you these, these, these days to be better? You know, I have always been a very curious person. So learning new things is just, um, has always come naturally to me. Always. Um, it, I probably would have to say that the pandemic didn't snuff that for me. It actually lit a fire underneath me. And I know by saying that some people might find that um, off putting because I know that's not the same for everybody else. The pandemic and the isolation, um, it has been a really tough thing for people, but we, we all um, operate differently. Right. And for me, um, I've always been the type of person that if there's um if there's something major going on in my life is actually usually when I ramp up and become more curious. Um, And I think it's, um, it's maybe it's a bit of a diversion tool to really focus on something and give meaning to what I'm living through at that point in time. Um, But I would also say what motivates me uh, more than anything is probably my son. Um, You know, I want to always be uh, a great role model for him Uh, I told him early on when he was much younger that you don't have to aspire to be one thing. Um, You know, everybody always says, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I always said to him, you could be many things when you grow up. So there's no limit. And frankly, I've reinvented myself several times um, throughout the years, just based on whatever my situation has been. So um, I do believe that that's part of what motivates me. That's great. Um, I like how you said to your son, he can be anything he wants to be. My mother didn't give me those options. It was a doctor or a lawyer. And I, <laughs> I, fa- I failed at both, but, but I think she's, pre- she's pretty okay with where I, where I ended up. But, you know, you, you touched on reinventing yourself. And I really, I really dig that. That's, uh, that's something that, you know, it's hard to grasp, right? Especially when you're in the situation and it's not, it's a lot of people don't always uh, come through that with flying colors. But, you know, when we talked uh, pre pre show, you told me you'd been in a couple other industries before this one. And then like we just said, you you stumbled your way into podcasting and same with me. You know, I I was, uh, I mean, I've always been in sales, but just all my career map is all over the place. And, you know, I, I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just kind of, was the next progression. And I didn't know I wanted to do a podcast it was kind of the next progression. And, and it, it's been fun reinventing myself along the way. It's just, you know, to, to be better, I guess. Right. You could say that. Yeah. Well, you know, to your point, um, sometimes it's best not to have everything be so linear, right. What, what the, you know, the famous, the path not taken, right. So yep. um, if you really 
just stay one course your whole life, you know, maybe you're missing something. So. That's pro- that'd probably be really boring too, you know. I've been yeah. <laughs> for, for me, for years. me, it would be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, that would be, but uh, you know, some people thrive on um, consistency. So I can't, I guess I can't judge that. Yeah, no, no judgment, right? Yeah. If you want to be a, right. an accountant for 70 years, by all means, just I, I have undiagnosed ADHD. My, my business partner will uh, say that that's not true, but it's definitely true. And so bouncing all over the place and, you know, doing seven things and having different career paths, that's, that's the life for me, just being kind of a organized chaos, if you will. Um, I like that. So during this pandemic, you brought it up. Um, you, were, you were just doing better. You're, you're doing better during the pandemic. How are you being better to yourself during the pandemic? How are you being better right now for, for yourself? Okay, so I'm not going to lie. I'm going to say that's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, so what I would say is there are, when I'm at the peak of the roller coaster, I'd probably say there's three things that I'm doing. Um, I'm walking a lot. Um, I now live in a city. Um, I moved from Connecticut to DC. So I'm walking far more than I ever did. And I find that um, it is a really, really great tool for de-stressing. I can't believe how much I enjoy it. Um, I know it sounds like a very passive exercise, but I'm putting miles on and I'm listening to podcasts and I'm listening to music and I'm catching up with friends and I'm off a screen and I'm in the fresh air. And so I would say walking has been beneficial for me. Um, I'd say the other peak is I'm focusing on listening more. I think that um, to be a better person, it's really important to try and listen and so when I'm dialing in with friends and, and family, I'm doing my best to, to listen to what they're experiencing and not judge it because everybody's experience right now is pretty dynamic and strange. Um, and then the third high I would probably say is that um, I'm trying my best to pay it forward. You know, if I learn something that I think somebody could benefit from, I go out of my way to send them off an email or set up a call with them um, just because that it feels good. And I think that we need to um, manufacture and come up with ways to make ourselves feel good that serotonin burst. Um, I'm not above adding chocolate to that mix, but (laughs) um, it's important. Um, But what I would say is, you know, I do have my lows too. And so I don't want to come off as, you know, I'm up all the time. This has really been challenging for a lot of people. I moved from the country to the city in the middle of a pandemic. Um, So it definitely has its low points. Um, So I'm doing my best to focus on my podcast and walking and helping friends out um, for those times when I'm feeling a little low. I try to move through it that way. I can totally relate. Uh, you know, it is the Be Better podcast, and uh, but we're on, I guess it's month eight of the pandemic on top of mm. probably the most contentious election to date in, in my memory. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's been yeah. just a year of pressure building right and then Mm -hmm. on top of that we've had a lot of civil unrest and you know a lot of uncertainty with work jobs so this year has definitely been trying up and down and i've had my roller coasters as well i've had and i'm i'm probably in a valley right now if i'm being honest my my back i threw my back out and i think it's all stress related and i got some some family issues going on which have been i mean not fun to deal with. And so with, with all that being said, you know, but the highs, when you're, when you're on your highs, like I will say exercise is, is key. There's, there's four things that I, I was told once it's to live like a a good, healthy round life It's exercise, meditation, eating healthy and journaling. And I try Mm -hmm. and do those four things on a daily basis. I fail probably as much as I succeed, getting all four of them done, but I at least get like two of those done on a daily basis. And when I get all four done, I feel great. I feel great. Hmm. So I I wish the person who gave you those four things, which are really great four things I might add, 
um, should probably have said to you, you don't have to be doing all four at the same time. So if in any given day, right, you've achieved two out of the four, I'd say that's a win. Well, then I guess I have more wins than losses. I think <laughs> I'll have so to go too. back and retake the tally. So, <laughs> so we talked about how, uh, what motivates you and how you're being better to yourself, but how are you being better professionally? I mean, you just said you moved from Connecticut to DC and started a podcast. So, you know, what, what are you doing professionally to be better? So maybe a, a, the idea of journaling, maybe mine's just on steroids a little. I've started writing um, and being in the content marketing space, I'm always writing, but I'm usually writing short form, you know, like I'm usually doing social media posts. Um, I'm corresponding with people um, and, and short form pushes you to be tight in, in how you communicate, right? Um, as few words as possible, but really drive them the message. Um, but I realized that I really do enjoy writing and I've always done writing in some way, shape or form. So um, I've expanded that and I've been uh, writing for um, a magazine. I, I joined a group called Rev Genius um, and they work in sales, marketing um, and revenue. And I've been, I've uh, published a couple articles with them and to be able to take a deep dive into a subject um, I found um, very interesting for me because um, I realized that I'm finally putting on paper um, all those things I've been curious about that I've been learning. Um, I'm now putting them on paper and sharing that. And, um, you know, one of the articles that I wrote was, was uh, why and how to start a podcast. And it's actually um, an abbreviated version of the book I'm working on um, for that. And I got a text last night from somebody who read it and gave it to his partner because he's been lobbying to start a podcast and he gave him the article and it helped him buy in on the idea. And for me, that was huge that I put my thoughts down on paper and I put it out there in the universe, which is a little nerve wracking because you don't know, like, is anybody going to like it or they're just going to like it because they're, you know, on social media. But um, to get something back like that, like just that one text, I could live on that for like six months. Like that, <laughs> that was just huge for me. Um, so professionally, I'm, I've been leaning in on that. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to do a plug, but I, I have written a book and it's in uh, beta testing right now. I have two people launching their podcast to be sure there's no holes in it, but it's um, basically a, a zero to, to launch how to guide on uh, starting your own podcast. I love it. That's great. I mean, that, that's what the new thing is, right? People are stumbling into podcasting. I had no idea what I was doing. I went on another guy's podcast as a uh, entrepreneur in orange County and they just were like, you should do your own podcast. And I was like, you know what, that's mm -hmm. not a bad idea. And then, uh, you know, that kind of morphed into this idea of the be better podcast and I had no idea what I was doing. I, I went into mm -hmm. the studio for the first couple of episodes and, you know, the studio engineer walked me through it and I stumbled and fumbled, but uh, it's just been fun. So to have a little how-to guide, it'll be great for, for the listeners out there. And there is nothing wrong with a, a, little, a little plug for the upcoming book. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you got into it accidentally too. You actually had someone to help you. I kind of wish I did, but um, but I guess if I did, I probably would have would not have written down the steps and, and ended up with a book. But right, um, that's I, the pay I think, it forward. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think uh, one thing I would add to that, um, and for your listeners as well, and be better. Um, you don't know what you don't know, and I think that that's a bit of a gift. Mm -hmm. um, because it allows you to embark on something with no preconceived ideas and uh, no rule book. And um, kind of sometimes rule books stink, you know, like they, they box you in. So I'm kind of glad you got into it accidentally too. Yeah. I didn't know all the errors that I was probably making and I made a few for sure. Yeah. But I want to ask you off, off here, uh, off of the, the list here, Mm -hmm. Culture Factor 2.0. Let's talk about that. Like what, mm -hmm. what's your favorite guest or your favorite episode? Let's, let's just dive into that a little bit. Oh, 
That's so mean to ask that question because there's so many amazing people. One that of I met. your one of your top memories. How about that? So uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna hurt anyone's feelings out there. All right. Can I do more than one, please? Yes, <laughs> two. Two. Your top right, two. Two. Okay. Two. So I interviewed at the beginning Lindsay Kaplan. Um, she is the co-founder of Chief. Um, it's an organization in New York City. They've since expanded to uh, the West Coast and I believe Chicago as well. Um, and it's a really unique organization because it's designed for women of the VP level and above. And it's a club, if you will, to support each other, to mentor up and down and to support them in growing their career and helping them um, get to the C-suite, but then also stay there. And um, I Great. just, yeah, I loved that. And when I started Culture Factor, um, one of the things that was imperative to me is I refused to do the podcast unless 50% of the voices were female and that there was diversity. I refused to do it any other way because we all know the C-suite is heavily weighted in white male and there's nothing wrong. I've met, you know, tons of amazing men in the process. Um, and I will speak to a couple of them, but, um, you know, to be able to give the mic to women in leadership, I find is really important because I think as, um, especially now, if other women hear themselves, they'll see themselves in those roles. Um, so I really enjoyed interviewing her. She's a mom. She's a, a new mom at that um, in a thriving company. And so I just really thought that she was an example of um, for many people. So I really enjoyed her. And um, recently I interviewed um, he's, he's like a legend. So I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm gloating, but um, it's Rashad Tabakawala. And I was, he said yes, right away when I offered, uh, when I asked him to interview and I'm, you know, still pretty small and he's been on the big wigs. He's been on like morning brew. He speaks for business week and Facebook and um, you know, top companies. He's t Time Magazine, top five marketing in innovators, just, a, you know, a powerhouse of a guy. But he was so um, genuine and articulate. And he just wrote the book, Restoring um, the Soul of Business. And I just felt that it was an evergreen book. It was so timely and yet can be relatable at any time in business. And he just was so lovely and accommodating and um, with making this interview with me and made the time. I, I have to say he just he's has so much great things to say. So I would I would give those two at the moment. That's but there great. was more. There was <laughs> more. You're killing so me. Many, well, that's but you know, this is just a sneak peek so that our audience can start listening and then they'll find their I, I hope they'll come on board. There's some really wonderful people I've interviewed. You were and you you brought up uh, you know giving the voice to as as many w women in leadership as possible. We're reading a book, and I I have to say I haven't started it yet, but we're doing a, a book club, and it's Lean In by uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Have you read it? I have not. I will have to read that. Yeah, so it's uh it's about women, work, and the will to lead, uh, and it was written in 2013 by Sheryl Sandberg, and she was the COO of Facebook, or she mm -hmm. may still be. But uh, yeah, so I know that our my business partner Kira read it, and she loved it. And uh, we usually do a book club a quarter, and someone takes the reins on it. So this was this was her choice, and people are reading it. And I've heard rave reviews. I need to start. Mine, we, I still have time, everybody, so don't worry, I'll get it done before the end of the year. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, um, I know that I'm excited to read it and it kind of, you jogged my memory on that. So it's probably a book you might want to pick up. Absolutely, I already wrote it down. All right, great. So <laughs> this is the last question we ask everyone on the show. What okay. do you consider yourself to be an expert at? And what is the best advice for our listeners to become an expert at said thing? There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, so I'm gonna say, you know, one of my favorite 
ways to describe myself is I'm a Swiss army knife in business. So I feel like I'm actually not an expert at anything. I feel like I am pretty good at a lot of different things. And again, this probably comes from reinventing myself several times. So um, I, I think I do all right in, in each of the things that I do. And I think that when I have to um, focus on one thing, I'm not sure that maybe I, I, I do my best to master it. I, I guess saying that I'm an expert at anything would just feel like a bit of a, an imposter syndrome thing. I don't know, but um, I do my best to master each thing that I do or to do the best to my own ability. Um, and I would probably circle back to the idea of education for people. Um, right now, I know it's hard for people to upskill, especially if it's a double income family, both working with children, homeschooling. I'm not saying that it's easy for anybody. Um, it just happens to be the best tool for me. Um, I feel that if you could learn anything new, um, even if it's the art of meditation, um, taking up yoga, um, learning podcasting, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter what it is. Anything you focus on increases like your brain plasticity, increases serotonins. Um, it makes you more productive because I hate to say it, if you want to get something done, give it to someone who's busy. Um, so I, I really feel that education is probably the way to um, get really good at, at just about anything. Great. And you're, you are actually the second person to say that on the podcast this season. If you want something mm -hmm. done, give it to someone that's busy. And I literally that's have true. never heard that one before either. So I'm just right. learning new things right now. I love it. <laughs> well, Holly, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, this has been really informative and fun. Um, I, I have enjoyed myself. I hope you have as well, audience as well. If, you, if the audience wants to get a hold of you, how can they reach you? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, LinkedIn is really a great place to connect with me. Um, and uh, I love to connect with people and, and have a dialogue with them. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well, and I'm happy to shoot over all of my handles if you want to throw them in the show notes. Um, but I'd probably say LinkedIn is a good place, and uh, I look forward to connecting with some of your listeners. Great. Well, thank you, Holly. And until thank next you. time, thank you, audience. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There is no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better.